China has been increasingly combative amidst the COVID crisis from India to Vietnam to Taiwan to Hong Kong. With me is a very special guest today. With me is the president of the Tibetan government in exile. So welcome to Vion. My first question to you is, what is the reason that China has been so combative amidst a major global pandemic? We have seen from India to across the world, there have been issues with China, it seems, is cropping up. You know, China is facing a lot of pressure, specifically external pressure, because WHO and 100 members have passed a resolution to investigate the origin of coronavirus which obviously originated in China. And then, you know, and then they're also getting blamed because they tried to hide the spread of coronavirus at the initial stage from three weeks to six weeks. And the whole world lost their time, right? Time to prepare uh, in dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. So they're getting blamed. And number two, coronavirus has really impacted the global economy all the countries in the world are negatively impacted and they lost so much of the economy because of the coronavirus and hence china is coming under pressure they are trying to distract the international community with specific countries as you mentioned from south china sea to east china sea to the border of india they are trying to distract it by you know with all these incursions and the tragedy which is very unfortunate so our condolences you know uh, go out to all those family members you know, of Jawans who died. Mm -hmm. So I was coming to that. Uh, we have seen the increased tensions between Beijing and uh, New Delhi over the border route. Uh, we have also seen the skirmishes in which India lost 20 of its soldiers. How do you see this pattern by the Chinese suddenly after 40 years, uh, China indulging in, uh, in, in a strong action in terms of uh, the border route between, uh, India, between India and China? You know, for the last 60 years, we have been repeating this as a mantra. And it's a fact that, you know, if you look at the map of China, the Han Chinese populated territory is only 40 percent of the area. Rest of 60 percent include Tibet, which is one fifth of China. Some say so. Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia and Manchuria and all that. So the, if you look at the Chinese empire, it has expanded because of invasion and encroachment. And then in the 60s, after the occupation of Tibet, Chinese leaders like Mao Zedong and others have said, Tibet is the palm, now they have to go after five fingers. That's Ladakh, you know, Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, and Arunachal Pradesh. So in 2017, we have Doklam incident, which bordered, you know, Sikkim and uh, Bhutan, you know. And then now you have in Ladakh. So this is all part of the grand long-term strategy of expansionists strategy that they had which they're implementing now and then unfortunately you know it has turned violent in recent case in Ladakh. Mm -hmm. So what would you suggest to countries like perhaps Nepal over this increase encroachment uh, by the Chinese? You know, to Nepal and to all the neighboring countries we've been saying the same thing. The way Tibet was occupied right so first they said, we'll build a road connecting China to Tibet. This will bring prosperity to Tibetans. Once the road was built, they brought trucks, tanks, guns, and soon they occupied us. In the process, they have a very shrewd strategy, which is called elite co-optation, to co-opt or buy off all the elite. Go after your leaders, political leaders. Go after your business people. Go after your intellectuals, right? Go after your journalists and go after your dharmic leaders so they buy off you know, each of the sectors of the community which are elite at the top so when the actual occupation happens you realize that elite in the country is divided one supporting china and one supporting you know their own country so in all the neighboring countries all over the world this is the process the procedure or the strategy that they implement they implemented in Tibet 60 years ago, and they're implementing it now in Nepal and all the countries around the world. So the blueprint that they use in Tibet, they're using it everywhere, including in Nepal. So this is taking place in Nepal. So what happened to Tibet? 
could happen to India, could happen to Nepal, could happen to Bangladesh, could happen to Maldives and Sri Lanka. So we just say, learn from us. Be careful. Uh, so you are saying, sir, that the Chinese are trying to buy perhaps the elite in Nepal? They do it everywhere. They do it in Europe. They do it in Australia. I've been to Australia. The former uh, foreign minister of Australia is the, you know, uh, the what do they call the uh, biggest consultant in, uh, in support of the Chinese government. You go to Europe, there are so many European countries where former ministers are uh, used or they are the you know, best spokesperson uh, defending uh, uh, China and you know, being a, you know, a what do you call advocate for Chinese investment and relationship with China and so on and so forth. When you say this happening in rich countries around the world, you won't be surprised it's happening in Nepal and it is. You know, to some extent, they're making efforts even in India, you know, so they do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Interesting, sir. But what do you think, sir, is the option in front of New Delhi? Do you think that military options uh, are available in terms of if you look at the power differential, uh, not only with India and China, but rest of the region? You know, the military option, because we believe in Ahinsa, non-violence should be the last one and should be only in self-defense, right? We advocate non-violence, we advocate Ahimsa, we advocate dialogue is the best way to solve any issue. First, you know, you have to defend your own country internally. As I said, this elite cooperation is also taking place, you know, I mean, with less success perhaps in India, but they do it, right? They do it as you yourself, you know, previously said you were invited to Tibet, uh, you know, were taken for a grand tour of Tibetan places. They show you development. They want you to return to India and highlight all the positive things that the Chinese government has done. This is how they try to co-opt, you know, this is how they try to, uh, you know, influence you. This is how they try to, you know, make you buy their propaganda. So. Mm. All these efforts, and thankfully, you know, journalists like you are not fooled and you were not taken for a ride, but mm. some do. Journalists do, intellectuals do, business people do, politicians do. And this is how they encroach within through the elite cooptation you know, process. Mm -hmm. So mm. India has to be very careful whether these things are taking place or not. Mm. So talking about Tibet now, so what is the future for, for, for the people like you who are fighting uh, against the Chinese rule in Tibet? What is the solution? I mean, it's been more than uh, 60 years, more than 50 years since uh, the, uh, your uh, region has been under the Chinese occupation. If you look at straightforward, then people will say, you know, there's a symmetric dynamic between Tibetan people and the Chinese government. They are very powerful, economically, militarily powerful. They have very powerful influence around the world, right? And so we are weaker in that sense. But if you look at the past 60 years, they destroyed 98% of monasteries and nunneries. They destroyed 99% of monks and nuns. They banned practice of Buddhism from the Tibetan plateau as a whole. It was a black hole. 60 years hence, you just look, Tibetan Buddhism is spreading all over the world, right? If you look at, we have rebuilt all the major monasteries in exile, mainly in India. And now Buddhism is back in Tibet in private social space, right? Government policy is still to destroy, to discourage Buddhism. They destroyed, you know, Larungar Monastery. They are destroying uh, Yachengar Nunnery. But if you look the, as a whole, the Buddhism is back in Tibet. So what it shows is that despite the effort to completely wipe out the Tibetan civilization, we are back practicing Tibetan Buddhism, wearing our own traditional dress, eating our own food, maintaining our own culture. Hence, Tibetan sense of identity and Tibetan sense of solidarity is very strong inside Tibet. So 60 years later, we are still strong internally and we are also strong you know, externally, because we have supporters all over the world and it's getting stronger from the European Parliament to US government is getting stronger. So, you know, we've been making uh, this noise, you know, being the spokesperson as to how Chinese government manipulated us into occupation with Tibet. And we have been the best spokesperson. So I would say our future is very hopeful. Mm -hmm. So how will you support New Delhi amidst this growing tension with the Chinese? We know there is a considerable anti-China sentiment in India now. Uh, so a role perhaps you can play? Do you see a role perhaps? 
Yes, our role has been very clear. We've been saying the same thing. China says Tibet is one of their core issues, very important issue for them. And India should say, yes, Tibet is also a core issue for India for geopolitical reason. Presently, with the border skirmishes, because there was never a border between India and China. It was always a border between Tibet and India. Let's go back to 1950s and 1940s. You don't need even policemen to patrol the border, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have battalions after battalions, regiments after regiments of you know, Indian forces. They're spending billions of dollars defending the border, which was not necessary because Tibet acted as the buffer zone. And it was a demilitarized border. And that's what we have to go back and we should say, if you solve the issue of Tibet, you can address the border issue. That's number one. And number two, awareness about Tibet is very, very um, less, you know, minimal in India. For example, if you go to America, you go to Harvard University, Cornell University or Columbia University or Virginia University, there are Tibetan studies programs. There are Tibetan Buddhism or Nalanda studies program all over. You go to Europe. But in India, now tell me how many major universities have Tibetan studies program? Mm -hmm. Now you have Doklam incident. I remember 2017, some journalists, people were asking, how do you define the term Doklam? It's a Tibetan word, Toklam, you know? Now, not mm -hmm. many experts knew that, right? If you don't have Tibetan studies program, universities where Tibetan PhDs, Tibetan you know, scholars can come and teach, you have to create awareness among the general population. At least the students and the intellectuals should know what happened to Tibet, what is this Tibet all about, then you will be better prepared, you know. Mm -hmm. So you must have this kind of program at the university level. So this is, you know, what we want to see. But sir, are you also intending to say that India should junk the one China policy? Now, one China policy was created solely for Taiwan because they have this one China, two interpretation concept, right? Mm -hmm. So then the one China was defined by China and then they shared it with the rest of the world. Now under this umbrella, Tibet and Hong Kong and other issues are also brought into. But this one China was specifically for Taiwan. Now people in Taiwan, including the T ambassador of Taiwan to India is saying it's time for India to review one China policy for Taiwan, right? So if mm -hmm. Taiwan, the main target or the main client is saying so, Indian government should you know, look into it, why Taiwan is saying it and what India could do. Mm -hmm. um, so my final question, um, we know Hong Kong is in the news for uh, obvious reasons, your new security law. Uh, what do you think about this? Do you think that uh, it's time that uh, the world should be more vocal about uh, Hong Kong, what's happening in Hong Kong? Of course, you know, people in Hong Kong are simply advocating their basic freedom and basic human rights, right to assembly, right to freedom of speech and democracy, you know. So now on them, the national security law is imposed. Again, again, here, we have been the first victim of national security law. You know, there's so many security laws are passed in Tibet. Each time the security law is passed, it essentially means that security is more important than individual freedom. Mm -hmm. Security more important than freedom of speech. Security more important than demonstration. Whenever there is a law is passed on unity, unity is more important than diversity. Unity essentially means co-optation and cultural assimilation. So we have seen this in Tibet. So people mm -hmm. in Hong Kong should also study what is this origin of security law in Tibet and how it is being interpreted now, explain one way, implement it differently, and then exploit it Finally, you know, mm -hmm. these are the things people can, you know, understand. So that's why mm -hmm. we say you have to study the issue of Tibet to understand the mindset, the manipulation and strategy of the Chinese government, be it mm -hmm. for India, be it for Nepal, be it for Hong Kong. So Tibet is the issue mm -hmm. that people need to pay attention. Also, to begin with, you know, I think even the news media, can say, yes, at present the border is between India and China, but actually, historically, it was always between Tibet and India, and mm -hmm. explain the historical status of Tibet as a zone of peace, as a demilitarized border. These are important reminders for people mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I know I've asked my last question, but one additional question, are you hopeful? Last, yes. Are you hopeful that the grand building behind you, the Potala Palace, which is a symbol of Tibet for, for centuries, you will be able to one day go in that building? Of course, that's why I'm sitting right next to the building with the national flag, with the, you know, our uh, lion, uh, you know, 
uh, clearly displayed in our national flag. This is our symbol, this is our movement, a peaceful, non-violent one led by a great 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. So one day soon, you will see us Tibetans back in Tibet and His Holiness Dalai Lama right in the Pothala building. Mm. Well, thank you so much, sir, for speaking to Vion so extensively and talking about how uh, this is a China, very aggressive China and world should be wary of it. Yes, thank you so much, Sidanji.